Jewish mythology and folklore, Lilith is a raven-haired demon who preys on helpless newborn infants and seduces unsuspecting men using their wasted seed to spawn hordes of demon babies. While her name only appears once in the Hebrew Bible, over the centuries, Lilith has been cast as Adam's rebellious first wife, the soulmate of Samael the demon king, and more recently, as a feminist icon. So who is the real Lilith? Long before Judaism claimed her, Lilith-like demons were haunting the nightmares of ancient Sumerians, Assyrians, and Babylonians. Male and female demons called Lilu and Lilitu respectively appeared in the Sumerian epic of Gilgamesh, and the Mesopotamian goddess Lamashatsu was a winged demon that tormented women during childbirth. The demon caused miscarriages and stole breastfeeding infants. What these various ill-named spirits had in common was a sinister desire to strike at humans when they were most vulnerable, particularly pregnant women and their newborns, in a pre-scientific age when infant and maternal mortality rates were wretchedly high. One ancient tablet discovered in Syria and dated back to the 7th century BCE includes a chilling plea to be spared the wrath of the black-winged demon. O oh, flyer in a dark chamber, go away at once, O oh, lily. Over the centuries, some scholars have proved out Lilith to be the first wife of Adam. We'll have to look back at the Jewish traditions and the Bible to discover what they say about this creature. In Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 to 28, we read, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our own likeness. And God, Elohim, created man in his image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fertile and increase. Now, you have to ask yourself a couple of questions from these two verses. First of all, when God is saying, Let us make man in our own image, who is he referring to us? Who are us? Let us make man. Who are us? Then, what is the image of God that God is creating man to be? Next, why create only two human beings and have them reproduce the entire world? Why couldn't God make many humans? And finally, the Midrash alludes to a legend that is also found in Plato's Symposium and in other ancient traditions that the first human being was actually a pair of twins attached to each other, one male and one female. God divided them and commanded them to reunite to find the other person who make each of them complete again in order to find wholeness. Now let's look at another verse in Genesis. We are now looking at Genesis chapter 2 verses 18. The Lord God, Adonai Elohim, said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a fitting helper for him. Up to this point, Everything God made was seen as good, but for the first time, something is seen as not good, that is, human loneliness in the absence of human association. The rabbis learn from Genesis chapter 2 verse 18 that it is not good for man to be alone. This line teaches about the existential condition of every man and not only of the situation of Adam before the creation of Eve. The Midrash asserts that any man who has no wife lives without goodness, without help, and without joy, without blessing, and without atonement. The Hebrew word for a fitting helper, Ezak Nego, can be understood to mean a helpmate equivalent to him. It need not imply that females to be subordinate or that her role will only be as a facilitator. According to Jewish folklore, Lilith was Adam's first wife. While she is not mentioned in the Torah, over the centuries she has become associated with Adam 
in order to reconcile contradictory versions of the creation in the book of Genesis. In the biblical book of Genesis, we find two contradictory accounts of humanity's creation. The first account is known as the priestly version and appears in Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 to 27. In these verses, we see that God fashions man and woman simultaneously. The text reads, So God created mankind in the divine image. Male and female, God created them. The second account of creation is known as the Yahwistic version and is found in Genesis chapter 2. This is the version of creation that most people are familiar with. In this version, God creates Adam, then places him in the Garden of Eden. Not long afterwards, he decides to make a companion for Adam and creates the animals of the land and the sky to see if any of them are going to be suitable partners for the man. God brings each animal to Adam, who names it before ultimately deciding that he's not a suitable helper. After this, God causes a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and while the man is sleeping, God fashions Eve from his side. When Adam awakes, he recognizes Eve as part of himself and accepts her as his companion. Not surprisingly, the ancient rabbis noticed the two contradictory versions of creation that appear in the book of Genesis. This is called Bereshit in Hebrew. They solve the discrepancy in two ways. The first version of creation actually referred to Adam's first wife, a first Eve. But Adam was displeased with her, so God replaced her with a second Eve that met Adam's need. The priestly account, that is the first account where God creates both man and woman, describes the creation of an androgen, that's a creature that is both male and female. You can find this information in Genesis Rabbah chapter 8 verse 1 and Leviticus Rabbah chapter 14 verse 1. This creature was then split into a man and a woman in the Yahwistic account. While the tradition of two wives, that's the two Eves, appears early on this interpretation of creation's timeline, it was not associated with the character of Lilith until the medieval period, as we shall see next. Now, Lilith is the most notorious demon in Jewish tradition. In some sources, she is conceived of as the original woman, created even before Eve, and she is often presented as a thief of newborn infants. Lilith means the night, and she embodies the emotional and spiritual aspects of darkness, that is, terror, sensuality, and unbridled freedom. More recently, she has come to represent the freedom of feminist women who no longer want to be good girls. The story of Lilith originated in the ancient Near East, where a wilderness spirit known as the Dark Maid appears in the Sumerian myth, The Descent of Inama. The myth was written around 3000 BCE. Another reference appears in a tablet from the 7th century BCE that was found in Aslan Tash in Syria, which contains the inscription, O fly in a dark chamber, go away at once, O Lily. Lilith later made her way into Israelite tradition, possibly even into the Bible, as we can see in Isaiah chapter 34 verse 14, which reads as follows. There good demons shall greet each other, and there the Lilith shall find rest. Some people believe this word Lilith is a reference to a night owl, and others say it is indeed a reference to the demon Lilith. A magical ball from the first century CE, written in Hebrew, reads, Designated is this bowl for the sealing of the house of this Jeonia Ba Mamai that there flee from him the evil Lilith. Ancient images of Lilith, which show her hands bound, appear to be a form of visual magic for containing her. In the Talmud, Lilith becomes not only a spirit of darkness, but also a figure of uncontrolled sexuality. The Babylonian Talmud says, it is forbidden for a man to sleep alone in a house, lest Lilith get hold of him. Lilith is said to fertilize herself with male sperm to give birth to other demons. In this next section, we're going to see what's written about Lilith and Adam.
In Genesis, we encounter a brief midrash that claims Adam had a first wife before Eve. This interpretation arises from the two creation stories of Genesis. In Genesis 1, man and woman are created at the same time, while in Genesis 2, Adam precedes Eve. The rabbinic tale suggests that the first creation story is a different creation in which Adam has a wife made just like him from the earth. For some reason, this marriage doesn't work out, and so God makes Adam a second wife, that's Eve. In the 9th or 10th century, a clever collection of legends titled The Alphabet of Ben Sira draws on earlier stories of Adam's wife and of Adam's coupling with demons and spins an elaborate story in which Lilith is Adam's first wife. This is how the story goes. When the first man, Adam, saw that he was alone, God made for him a woman like himself from the earth. God called her Lilith and brought her to Adam. They immediately began to quarrel. Adam said, You lie beneath me. And Lilith said, You lie beneath me. We are both equal, for both of us are from the earth, and they will not listen to each other. As soon as Lilith saw this, she uttered the divine name and flew up in the air and fled. Adam began to pray before his creator, saying, Master of the universe, the woman that you gave me has fled. God sent three angels and said to them, Go bring back Lilith. If she wants to come, she shall come. And if she does not want to come, do not bring her against her will. The three angels went and found her in the sea at a place where the Egyptians were destined to drown. There, they grabbed her and said to her, If you will go with us, well and good. But if not, we will drown you in the sea. Lilith said to them, my friends, I know God only created me to weaken infants when they are eight days old. From the day a child is born until the eighth day, I have dominion over the child. And from the eighth day onward, I have dominion over him if he is a boy. But if a girl, I rule over her twelve days. They said, We won't let you go until you accept upon yourself that each day one hundred of your children will die. And she accepted it. That is why 100 demons die every day. They will not leave her alone until she swore to them, In any place that I see you or your names in an amulet, I will have no dominion over that child. They left her, and she is Lilith, who weakens the children of men. This is an excerpt from the alphabet of Ben Sira. Some people believe that this story is a serious attempt to explain the death of infants. But others are convinced that it's just a humorous tale of sexual quarrels and unsuccessful angels. The Lilith of this story confronts both Adam and God. She defies patriarchy, refuses a submissive sexual posture, and in the end refuses marriage altogether, preferring to become a demon rather than live under Adam's authority. Notice that Lilith flees to the Sea of Reeds, the place where the Hebrews will one day go free from slavery. In this version of the Lilith story, Lilith becomes what all tyrants fear, a person who is aware that she is enslaved. This version of the Lilith tale in the alphabet of Ben Sira quickly spread throughout Jewish life and others expanded on it. For example, the Zohar, which is a mystical work from the 12th century Spain, imagines Lilith not only as the first wife of Adam, but also as the wife of Saturn. In the Kabbalah, Lilith takes on cosmic powers. She is a chaotic counterpart to the Shekinah, that's the female divine presence and the bride of the infinite. In fact, the Zohar imagines that while the Jews suffer in exile, the Holy One, that's the masculine aspect of the divine, separates from the Shekinah and consorts with Lilith. Lilith's sexual spiritual link with the divine will only end when the Messiah comes and the brokenness in the world is mended. In folk Judaism, the primary myths about Lilith continue to identify her principally as a stealer of babies. Numerous amulets for pregnant women and babies from medieval through modern times use the three names of the angels mentioned in the alphabet of Ben Sira. The angels are Sanvi, 
Tansamvi and Samangelov. The angels' names are used to ward off Lilith. Such amulets may also contain a circle with the name of Adam and Eve on the inside of the circle and the name of Lilith on the outside. This is clearly a warning to Lilith to stay outside of the family realm. A red ribbon is sometimes placed on a crib to ward off Lilith. Later legends characterized Lilith as a beautiful woman who seduces men or capitulates with them in their sleep, then spawns off demon children. According to some accounts, Lilith is the queen of demons. In the modern period, the tale of the put-upon wife who flees to a place of liberation became a celebrated paradigm. Numerous modern Jewish poets and authors, female and male, wrote accounts of Lilith that used old stories to express new ideas. Perhaps the best known of the new Lilith tales is The Coming of Lilith by Judith Plasco. In this feminist midrash, Lilith flees the garden because she is a UPT woman who doesn't want to be pushed around by Adam or God. However, she misses female companionship. Lilith soon sneaks back into the garden and befriends Eve. Eve has been told Lilith is a demon, but once the two women share their stories, they become allies and companions in the search for knowledge. In a dame, in her poem, Lilith, imagines Lilith as an eternal bohemian who lives Eden, drops in and out of men's sexual fantasies in the Middle Ages, and now lives with a cab driver in New Jersey, where she still cries in the bathroom as she remembers Eden and the man and the god I couldn't live with. In Lynn Gottlieb's story of Lilith, Lilith is made from the sky and Adam from the earth. In her love for Adam, Lilith chooses to forget she came from the sky and she becomes Eve, settled and happy but ignorant of her own true nature. In her story, Gottlieb dramatizes the struggle of women to love men while still loving themselves. So, who really was Lilith? Was she Adam's first wife, as mentioned in the first creation story? Or is she just a figment of imagination created by the Ben Sira stories? I'll leave that up to you to decide.